Uh, so this is the second week of our summer series. It's called Summer at the Movies. Uh, and each week we're looking at a different movie, but it's not really about the movie. Really what we're doing is we're looking at the life of Jesus and his ministry and what he said and what he did. And so these movies are just sort of a jumping off point in order for us to do that. But one of the things that we're encouraging you to do over the course of the summer is to read the Gospel of Mark. Uh, and we have a little reading guide. You can get it out there uh, in the lobby or if you're watching online, it's at riverage.church and then go to reading plans uh, under next steps. But we want you to read the gospel so that this summer we're focused on Jesus in all sorts of ways. Uh, but we're using these different movies as a jumping off point to talk about the gospel. So the movie this morning, as you can see, is The Greatest Showman. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have seen The Greatest Showman? Okay, a lot of you. How many of you guys have not seen The Greatest Showman? Okay. How many of you hate musicals and you're never going to see The Greatest Showman? Okay, <laughs> I had to ask that because last week I asked the same thing about A Quiet Place. Um, so, but here's the thing is this, uh, whether you, you know, like musicals or not or that kind of movie. Um, so basically what the movie is about, it's about the life of P.T. Barnum. And he's the founder of the Barnum and Bailey Circus. And so it's kind of about the beginnings and the foundation of him getting this circus started. Um, and it's, and it's one of those things where I watched the movie and then I kind of looked at some of those fact or fiction websites. And there's a lot of fiction in it. It's not all facts, but that's not really where we're going anyway. Um, but it's this uh, movie about his life. And there's a scene out of the movie that I want to uh, kind of bring to life for you. And so uh, he, P.T. Barnum lost his job as a shipping clerk. And so he decides he's going to start a museum. And so this museum is kind of boring and nobody really comes. And so he's having a conversation with his daughters. And he says, and they say to him, Daddy, it just, it's boring. You need something alive at this museum. And so this starts this probably, I don't know, probably six or eight minute scene <clears throat> where Barnum, P.T. Barnum, goes around and he begins to find people to be a part of this show. And it wasn't even called a circus to begin with. And he goes around and he begins to find people and the, the music plays. It's called a song called Come Alive. And he puts up posters and he knocks on doors and he interviews people. And he gets this great group of people to be a part of this first kind of live performance, which later be call, would be called a circus. But as he talks to these people, <clears throat> a lot of them are reluctant. A lot of them are like, I'm not sure I buy into this. I think people are just going to make fun of me. They're fearful, and those types of things go through their kind of their thoughts. But as the movie goes on, and as, and as Barnum kind of casts the vision for these people, he says some great phrases, and you heard some of them in the trailer. He says, everyone is special, and no one is like anyone else. He says, no one ever made a difference by being like everyone else. And he cast a vision for these people to become and be part of something bigger than themselves. And here's the tie-in for us and the gospel. Is that Jesus did the same thing. But not to build the greatest show on earth, but he did it to build the greatest show in heaven, so to speak. You see, what Jesus did with the 12 disciples is he took this kind of ragtag group of spiritual misfits and he turned them into the founding fathers of the church he had a vision for these guys lives these 12 guys that they didn't even have for themselves now it's interesting as you think about the disciples and as we think about the disciples we think about them as these spiritual giants, Peter, James, John, you know, and then the traitor Judas. And we think about them as these spiritual giants. But in fact, when Jesus called them, that couldn't have been further from the truth. In fact, they were kind of more like left out spiritually than they were spiritual giants. Because the way that it worked at this point in time, in terms of disciples, is there would be a rabbi. And the rabbi would find young men, very young men, even really boys, kind of 8, 10, 12-year-old boys, that he would see a future and a potential in them. And they would ask to be his followers, and he would kind of accept them to be his followers. But they were young. By the time that these men, the men whose names we know, Peter, James, 
John, by the time that they were introduced to Jesus, they were long past the time period of one's life that they would be called to be a disciple. And so I want to make a kind of a comparison between them and us. And here's what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go through, and I've, I've never done this in a sermon, and I've never really done this even in my own study time, but I did this this weekend, and I'm just excited to share this with you. But basically what we're going to do is we're going to do a flyover of the 12 disciples, and how were they called, and what were their personalities, and so forth. But out of that, here's what we're going to see, is we're going to see that each of the disciples was unique. It was not just like one group of 12 who were all the same. They were unique, and what I hope to happen out of that is that we see their uniqueness, that we see the uniqueness of how God created us. And as they were called to follow Jesus, that we could see that Jesus is calling us to fulfill the vision that he has for this world, but also to fulfill the vision that he has for our lives. And part of the reason that he's able to do that is because of the uniqueness that all of us have. So I'm going to read to you from Luke chapter 5 to begin with. And this is a list of the 12 disciples. And then what we're going to do is we're going to follow this list pretty much in order of how Luke tells us the names of the disciples. So this is Luke chapter uh, 6, and it says this. In these days, he, that's Jesus, went out to a mountain to pray. And all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose them, chose from the twelve, whom he called apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon who was called the Zealot, and Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot who became a traitor. So that's the list of names. And it's kind of interesting to, no, to note, did you notice that there are two sets of brothers in here, James and John, Simon and Andrew, or Peter and Andrew. There's also six people who share common names. There's two Jameses, there's two Judases, and there's two Simons. And there's also, we'll get to this in a few minutes, there's also a twin in this group of disciples. But we're going to start by looking at Peter and then and at Andrew kind of together. So the the calling of the different disciples are recorded in various places in the in the gospels. Um, but we're going to start in John chapter 1 verse 35. Um, and so what we've got here is we've got Andrew. Okay? Now, uh, of all the disciples, he was probably I would say the most likely to be called as a disciple of Jesus because, and maybe you didn't know this, maybe you didn't know this, but Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist. And so before Jesus kind of came into public ministry, there was John the Baptist and he went around and preaching and he was saying, look forward to the Messiah, look forward to the Messiah. And Andrew was one of the disciples of John before Jesus came on the scene. So it says this. It says, the next day... Again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus, and as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Then skipping down to verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, we talk about uniqueness. So Andrew was probably one of the more unique and different disciples of Jesus. Now, if you know much about kind of rabbis and so forth, it was really like an apprenticeship that a, that a rabbi would have disciples, and those disciples, their goal was to become like their rabbi in every way that they could, to talk like him, to walk like him, to learn from him, to study from him, to imitate him in all sorts of ways. And so Andrew first followed John the Baptist, and John the Baptist was kind of like the original hippie. Basically, he, he wore kind of um, like furry clothes. He ate locusts. He lived out kind of on his own. He's kind of like a hermit, hippie kind of person. And so that's the type of person that Andrew would be. Now, the first thing that Andrew did is he says he went and found his brother, P- 
Peter, or his brother Simon. Simon Peter is referred to both ways. Now, Peter's um, call is actually found in all four Gospels, but they give little different portraits or different pictures of how it was that Peter came to be a disciple of Jesus. And so, uh, actually, I'm going to put a slide up here if you want to. I'm going to read parts of those verses if you want to use your phone and snap this and look at it later. Because it's one of those times where we have to look at the scripture and go, well, it says one thing here, and another thing here, and another thing here. And how do we kind of synthesize those? Because on the surface, it's like, kind of seems like they're different. But yet, if we look at them together, we can say, okay, together it makes a complete picture of the call of Peter. So we're going to start off in John, right after what I just read. It says this. Uh, it says, he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. So that's the first introduction that Peter has to Jesus, from Jesus to Peter. And then we go and we look in the Gospel of Mark. In the Gospel of Mark, it says this, chapter 1, verse 16. It says, passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Now, you may have heard this story, and you may have even heard it taught like, and there were Simon and Peter, and Jesus just walked by and he said, follow me. And just in total blind faith, they just followed him, never having met Jesus before. But we put this together with what we read in, in the Gospel of John, that they had actually met him before. And just if you're interested in kind of figuring out, like, how do biblical kind of scholars figure this out? How do they put these in a chronological order? Earlier in verse 14, it says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. And so that helps us to know that what we read in John, because John makes the introduction, uh, John the Baptist makes the introduction, and so this follows it. And then there's a third part to the story, and this is in Luke chapter 5. In Luke chapter 5. And it says, uh, it says this, and this is a story that you may be familiar with. Uh, so I'll kind of tell the first part and then read the second part. So the, Jesus is in the morning and he's preaching. And he says, can I use your boats? And he pushes out on these boats that belong to Simon and Peter. And he gives a sermon and he teaches. And then he says, hey, why don't you put down your nets and catch something? And Peter is like, we fished all night, Jesus. Why do you think that putting down our nets is going to help us get more fish? We've already fished and there's no fish out there today. And he says, but because you say so, I will do it. And he puts down his nets, and they have what's known as a miraculous catch of fish. And then here's the reaction, what follows. This is chapter 5, verse 9. It says, for he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon, and Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So that's how he was called to be a disciple of Jesus. Now, Peter's life, we could spend a lot of time looking at Peter's life because that's the disciple of which there's probably more written than any other disciple. He's the guy that walked on water with Jesus. He's the first one to proclaim, you are Jesus, the son of the living God. The first one to kind of recognize Jesus for who he was. He was also the one who denied Jesus. He was also the one who cut off the ear of a, of a soldier who's trying to arrest Jesus. It's been said about, G, about Peter that his motto was ready, fire, aim. Because he was always kind of acting before thinking and speaking before thinking. And I share that with you. Because he is unique. He is different from Andrew, and we're going to find out that he's different from the other disciples. And you, as you look in the mirror, you may look in the mirror and go, man, I'm different than everybody else. Can God really use me? Or you may even have a comparison. Where you look at somebody else who's a follower of Jesus and you say, well, they're so different, they're so much better, they can 
have more of an impact for God. They can, and you have that comparison thing. But part of what I want us to see as we look at these disciples is that God can use you. That God has uniquely made you. And you are different from other people who follow Jesus. The next two disciples that are mentioned in this list that uh, Luke writes down for us is James and John. And so James and John, they're brothers, they're the sons of Zebedee, but they were given a nickname. Their nickname was the Sons of Thunder. And so it's interesting as you look at them, and they appear a couple different places, but the place that they appear the most, kind of the story that's about them the most, is they have an argument about who's the greatest. I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest. And you can kind of see from them, and with that nickname of, of the Sons of Thunder, Thunder, what did I say? Yes. So interestingly enough, just a little side quirk because I just list there, but I had a lisp up until I was about five years old, and my mom and dad sent me to therapy until I could get rid of my lisp. So there we go. So I occasionally slip back. How about that? The sons of thunder, not the thuns of thunder. Got that. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. Freebie. God has uniquely made me. There we go. Um, but, you know, you look at these two guys, and they were so competitive, and they just strike me as kind of like the macho jocks that walk around a high school, you know, like, hey, what's up? It's thunder time, you know, and, and that sort of thing. And they were brazen in that way. And maybe that's you, and that's your personality, and that God has given you that personality because he wants you to follow, to follow him using how he's created you to be. So next in the list of disciples uh, are um, Philip and Bartholomew. And some of these guys have different names depending on whether they're referred to by their Greek name or a Hebrew name or just a nickname. Um, so Nathaniel is talked about, and Bartholomew and Nathaniel are the same name, just called one in one gospel and one in the other gospel. But this is what it says about the calling of Nathaniel and Philip. This is John chapter 1, verse 33. To verse 43. It says, The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses talked about in the law, and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. And so Philip, you can tell just from the story that he's a social guy. He's like, hey, come meet this guy, Jesus. Come meet this guy. He's mentioned a couple other times in the gospel. Uh, there's the feeding of the 5,000, and there's the disciple mentioned who said, hey, we need to make sure everybody's got food, not just us. That was Philip. There's another time where Philip steps up and he says, hey, we want everybody to be able to see the Father. How does that happen? He's that guy that says, let's get everybody involved. And, you know, maybe you're that kind of person. Like, you don't go anywhere alone. You're like, man, we got to make this a party. we got to get everybody to do this. That was Philip's personality. Nathaniel's personality was quite different from that. He was the skeptic. You might even say he was the pessimist, right? Does that describe your personality? Don't raise your hand. Right, but that I know that describes some of you. You're like you're kind of skeptical, you're kind of pessimistic, and you look at what he does, and he says, "So Philip says, hey, come see Jesus. He's from Nazareth." And Nathaniel, or also called Bartholomew, says, "Nazareth? How can anything good come from Nazareth? You're from West Virginia. You know how this goes." You meet somebody from someplace else. You know, where are you from? I'm from West Virginia. And they're like, oh. You know, or where are you from? I'm from West Virginia. Oh, I've got a cousin that lives in Richmond. That's close to Western Virginia. It's like, no, it's West Virginia. We are our own state, right? Or how about Charleston, right? You say you're from Charleston and somebody goes, oh, man, that is a beautiful city right on the ocean there. And you're like, that's Charleston, South Carolina. Right? So when, when he says, Nazareth, any good can from Nazareth, we get that. But how does Philip respond? He says, come and see. Come and find out for yourself. Here's the next disciple. It's Matthew. 
And Matthew, is, his call is found in uh, the gospel that he wrote, Matthew chapter uh, 9, and it says this. It says, and as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me, and he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. So he was uh, Matthew, or sometimes called Levi, he was a traitor to his own people. That he was, li- he was a Jew, and the Jews were occupied by the Romans, and the Romans basically used traitors to the Jews to collect the taxes. He knew who had money and who didn't have money, and so the Romans had him go and collect taxes from them, and then he could keep a cut of that for himself. And then he becomes a Christian, he becomes a follower of Christ, and he invites all these people to a party to meet Jesus. And maybe that's your personality, in the sense that you want everybody to meet Jesus, but maybe that's also your story. That if people knew your past, you'd be embarrassed by it. But God has transformed your life. Got a couple more, and these will go pretty quickly. The next one is Thomas. Uh, Th- so Thomas, most of us probably know, Doubting Thomas, that's the story that he's kind of famous for. He's like one of those empirical guys. He's like, I got to know, I got to find out for myself. Facts, figures, show me what it is, right? And so we call him Doubting Thomas. But I think probably a better term would be Investigative Thomas. And that's you. You want to find the facts and the figures. You want to figure out stuff for yourself. A um, couple other things about Thomas that I discovered this week. He was super passionate. Uh, there's a time when... Jesus was going to, um, to see Lazarus, but Lazarus had died. And in his zeal, Thomas goes, yeah, let's go and we can die too. I'm sure the disciples were like, what are you talking about? Right? Maybe he was hanging around Peter a little bit too much. Um, he was also incredibly curious. Uh, so there's a famous quote, famous thing that Jesus said, where he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. It was Thomas's question that led to Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Next in the lineup is James, son of Alphaeus. Nothing about him other than he's mentioned here. Um, And then next in the list is uh, Simon the Zealot. And Simon the Zealot, and we talked about him actually a couple weeks ago, was very different from Matthew. Zealot meant that he, he was part of this party of the Zealots, and their goal was to overthrow the Roman government. And God used him, and Jesus called him. Second to last is Judas. And this is Judas, the son of James, also called Thaddeus. And I would imagine um, that just Judas lived a difficult life. Because he was always being like misunderstood or misrepresented as the other Judas. Right? So he meets people, yeah, I follow Jesus, my name is Judas. And they're like, thought that you betrayed him and then hung yourself. No, 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 that's the other Jews. Just my, Thaddeus, just, just call me Thad. And we went on from there. Uh, and then there's Judas Iscariot, who is um, listed as the one who became a traitor. And uh, we're actually going to talk, I'm not going to talk about him now, but we're going to talk all about Judas next week, give you a little preview. So the sermon title for next week is The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, And so the Empire Strikes Back, you want to watch this week as your sermon research, and then we're going to talk all about Judas next week. So I'm pretty excited about that. So I want to close um, with this, and we're a couple minutes over, and it's because Jay sang too slowly. Um, (laughs) But uh, we will wrap this up very quickly. The phrase that is most well-known and the simplest for Jesus calling the disciples, he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Every one of you is unique. Every one of you is different, but every one of you is called by Jesus to be his disciple. And this phrase, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men, is a great job description of a disciple. The first one is follow me, is to follow Jesus, to imitate Jesus, to learn about him, to read the Gospels, to see and to follow, and just to be like him as much as you can. The second, he says, I will make you. Follow me and I will make you. 
is that your job description is to be transformed. But it's not what you do. It says, I will make you fishers of men. I will make you. That Jesus transforms us and to allow him to transform us. It can be a slow process. But we open up our hands and our hearts and our lives and we say, Jesus, I give you permission to transform me. And then the call, the last part, I will make you fishers of men. That your call is to invest in the lives of other people. People who are far from God. People who would never set foot in a church. People who are antagonistic towards Jesus. You are to be a fisher of those men and of those women. To pray for them. To invest in them. To reach out to them. To love them. To care for them. To build relationships with them. To build friendships with people who are far from God. That's what it means to be a fisher of men. All of us are uniquely made. And it's interesting, that song in The Greatest Show, and I want to come back to that, the song that that uh, kind of calling of these people who are going to be in the circus, it's set to a song called Come Alive. And I can't help but realize how much of a parallel that plays with us. That when we learn to follow Jesus, when we learn to have our lives transformed, when we are making fishers of men, when we are becoming fishers of men, that's when we come alive. When you use the gifts that God has uniquely given you, that is when you are most alive.